somebody. Friday afternoon is always difficult. People are like, hey, what am I doing tonight? And where am I going? It's sort of seminar. This is spectacular. I've been here 12 years, and as I said today uh, on air, uh, it, it's a most confused, conflicted Davos. And uh, we've had enjoyed the honor of having uh, Professor Spence and Dr. Bremer uh, join us. And to speak with Arif Nak uh, V. as well, uh, Ricardo Moreno with us, uh, with a Latin American view. And I'm absolutely thrilled that Mrs. Bachelos uh, has joined us with, with the most interesting and eclectic uh, view. Um, so I think it's a timely seminar. We've had any number of ways to go. And I think instead of the normal format, I'm just going to go as rapidly as I can to give you the insight of five very different and esteemed guests. And then we'll go to your questions uh, and, and observations, short observations, too, to squeeze it into uh, one hour. Emerging markets, decelerating growth, rising U.S. interest rates, changing the outlook for emerging markets, global high growth markets, and of course the idea of a divergence, a separation, and maybe a partition of emerging markets as well. And of course we have here so many nations represented, Michael Spence in New York and Italy, and spending a lot of time in China, a reef with a, a fabulous knowledge of the Middle East, uh, Afsane Iran and her work in Washington, Ian Bremer, is from the land of G0. I have no idea what that means, but we'll, we'll get to that as well. Uh, Mrs. Bachelors, let me start with you with the ultimate emerging market with Secretary Kerry uh, speaking today. I guess Iran is the ultimate emerging market. Do you have optimism about an immediate impact from new flows in and a new animal spirit within Iran? Interesting question. Uh, we've been talking a lot more about the politics of Iran in the sessions in Davos, and I think much less about the economy and yes. the markets, as you said. Um, there is a vibrant capital market in Iran relative to sort of other, I would say, frontier emerging markets. So there's a real capital market. You could have borrowed on credit in Iran like 30 years ago, before the revolution. Uh, in some ways, obviously, uh, limitations now have changed those capital markets. Uh, Iran never, before the revolution, needed to access the bond market, so has never issued an uh, uh, mm -hmm. international bond. Uh, so looking at the markets, my old friend Barton Biggs used to desperately want to go oh. to Iran to hike mm -hmm. and to be the first investor mm -hmm. in the equity markets that there. And like unfortunately, he passed Barton, before yeah. being able to do both of those things. Um, so. I think it provides huge amount of uh, potential. Uh, the me most interesting part of, uh, I think, Iran's um, capital right now is that while the education sector has gone back hugely since the revolution, you have at the same time, on a relative basis, have very good technical education. So mathematicians will come to work at a firm like Renaissance at the hedge fund. Doctors will come with their doctorate degrees and move right into US um, top research uh, institutes. That's one side of the economy. The other side of the economy is um, huge inequality. You have got huge problems with um, health, and, um, and AIDS is a big problem in Iran. The, the, problems, the health problems in Iran today are both the basic health problems, in terms of uh, the fact that vaccination has kind of gone back. So you have right. basic health that had you know, uh, got better, uh, has become much worse, as well as the modern diseases of diabetes and AIDS yeah. and so on and so forth. So you have to deal with those. And people don't realize at the same time what you hear from Iran right now is, for example, you know, there's a big refugee problem. The Afghans and Pakistanis who moved mm -hmm. into Iran, believe it or not, that was sort of the first wave. <laughs> Uh, more than a million, it's I hear. It's making the cover of the Washington Post. Right. And um, what I heard is that there might be like a market so that uh, in the war for I with ISIL, um, there's a disproportionate number of these refugees. They will get Iranian mm -hmm. nationality potentially if they get $5,000. So. Arif, I, I look one day after the agreement or whatever in the Wall Street Journal right-hand column is already pushing against the hopes of a new Iran. For, from a Middle Eastern investment perspective, do you have an optimism of moving forward? And I don't mean long term, I mean even in the next six months. So look, the I mean, since you started by saying let's talk about the economics in Iran, I have to say that the um, trade between the Middle East and Iran has, we must not forget, 
that there are geopolitical issues that are at play here. Mm -hmm. And definitely within the Middle East and definitely within the countries on both sides of the Gulf. So I feel that when you talk about the prospects for Middle Eastern business in Iran, I think the politics have to clean themselves out first, and only then will the opportunity present mm -hmm. itself. Okay, so our first look at Iran as an emerging market. Part of the theme that we have is rising U.S. interest rates. Um, I guess in the last few days, thank you, Mr. Draghi, that's been amended at 197 on the 10-year. You know, Michael Spence, give us an economic lesson on the certitude of rising U.S. interest rates. We've only been wrong for the last six years. No, that's right. So we've had for growth forecasts that were overly optimistic, and there's a range of views. But I think there's a clear sign of weakening, a growing sense that we'll come in under the 2-plus percent forecast. And that leads people, I think, correctly to <clears throat> guess not that the Fed will stop, but maybe slow it down. Uh, so that, but that, from a kind of global point of view, means slower, not whether or not, uh, just slower. And I think from the emerging economies point of view, not that much change. There's nothing has been telegraphed as carefully as this, plus and minus. I don't. So nothing like a taper tantrum is going to occur. You know, with the volatility that went with it. But on the other hand, a number of emerging economies living in a world where <clears throat> money was rushing around looking for yield, you know, got a bit dependent on very low cost external capital. And I think, hopefully, uh, the majority are getting, rid, uh, getting ready uh, for a process of going back to a slightly different world. I do not, Tom, expect an, a dramatic outrush of capital that produces liquidity crises in most right. places. Oh, that's been the responsible message we've heard from you uh, for years. Part of it is that phrase, taper tantrum. I'm going to blame the media for inventing that. I'm not quite sure who, who coined it. How do you bring a developed world taper tantrum over to the emerging markets? How do you bring it over? Yeah, do you have a shock within the spread market? Do you have a shock within the currency market? Well, you could. I mean, if you get a big enough convulsion in, uh, in a number of markets, including the equity markets, and people panic... Mm -hmm. then, then we have a different scenario and story. And I know this is being talked about around here. I, this is, you know, nobody has a crystal ball, and certainly economists have the worst ones, but, uh, but I just don't see that right. as the most likely outcome. Let's look at the outcome of living with a reality. Ricardo, uh, with your focus on Latin America, you're enjoying Brazilian real, uh, 4, 410, 415, all the political uh, story of South America. What is your optimism that on a political economic basis, the emerging markets of South America will clear in 2016 and move on to a better uh, economy and a better politics? Well, first of all, we need to understand the context those emerging markets, especially Latin America, is living at right now. And you pointed out the panorama of this new reality that basically we have the end of a super cycle in emerging markets mm -hmm. and Latin America is very correlated with the price of commodities. And as you said, as once uh, the tightening cycle of um, the Fed uh, starts and China shows the slowdown and oil prices are below 30, will surely impact um, Latin America. And we see this trend of uh, commodity prices going down. If you look adjusted to CPI since the 20s, it's a downtrend. That will affect because copper prices, the Chile is very dependent, down 50% mm -hmm. this year, iron ore 80%. Soybean 50, oil more than 70%. So what does it mean to emerging markets? You know, all, all of these uh, forces definitely means a more challenging and more risky uh, environment ahead. And as U.S. interest rates goes up, emerging markets bonds, Latin American bonds, will be less attractive, liquidity will be more expensive, and developing countries in this region will face tighter economical financial conditions. So all those crises, as the Chinese say, create opportunities. Right. And uh, what we've been seeing once the government has to adjust budget, adjust uh, uh, the fiscal side um, of, the, of, the, of the, the, the economy, uh, we see opportunities for the change of power as well, as you saw in, in Argentina, Argentina yeah. and we saw the second um, elections in, in Venezuela as well. When you look at South America, part of the question here is financial stability. I don't need you to make an earnings forecast on your own bank. We, if you'd like to, you could. But uh, the, 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 the basic idea of financial stability, Willem Bauder of Citigroup and LSE, would suggest we have good financial stability within all our turmoil. Would you suggest we have good financial stability within your South America? 
I will suggest so, and better than in the past. If you look um, at emerging markets, uh, had sudden capital outflows, uh, especially uh, uh, last year, and we're going to leave with lower and much more volatile commodity mm -hmm. prices uh, going ahead. We, in general, we see that most of these countries, they're more resilient. They have prepared their economies for this downturn of the cycle. You see the buffers of uh, international reserves, they pretty much adequate levels in most of the country. Even Brazil has 20% of uh, GDP on reserve. External positions also have become more resilient. If you look to what um, short-term debt is just a fraction of the liabilities and mostly right. a local currency denominated without any uh, mismatch. And also public debt is pretty much uh, under control. Exception is Brazil, which is spiraling a little right. bit up to 70%. And yeah. the currency devaluation, yeah. which will become and make those countries even more competitive on the export side and the, the balance of payments. That's good to get us started. I saved Ian Bremer for last. I urge you to look at his article in Norm Perlstein's Time magazine, uh, a, a really wonderful issue on this gloom about recession. And I know if you push against that gloom with some real optimism. Ian, you speak within your wonderful Eurasia Group piece on the hollow alliance. So we see that with Chancellor Merkel now coming here this year. How does the hollow alliance across the Atlantic among the haves affect the emerging markets? Well, I mean, yeah, okay, I see why you wanted to go last on that. Um, it's not a small question. I, I think around all of these individual issues, in many ways, I think the political risk environment is not quite as dire as the mood in Davos this year, um, certainly in terms of China. Uh, and the ability of the Chinese you government think to respond. Mr. Soros is off the mark. I, I think a lot of people are off the mark. So not, I mean, not economically. Uh, they have a better sense of that than I do. But the ability of the Chinese government to actually say not just they're going to spend reserves, but that, they, that any Chinese market, national market participant, will jump, will say how high if you tell them to jump. I think state capitalism gets you that. And the fact that they haven't asked for that means they haven't had to. But they will. Um, I'm, I'm less worried about that. I'm, I'm not worried as much about Brexit as some people are right here. But, but I do think that the weakness of what has been the most important alliance in the world, and certainly for this organization, right, for the last 75 mm. years, the one that has upheld security norms such as they've existed, and has upheld the free market and rule of law and democracy and all of these, that is now at its weakest point. Um, and, and I think that that does a lot to unnerve us. It, it undermines the way we think about the future of a global free market. Clearly, um, emerging markets will hedge much more in that environment. They'll be uh, much more interested in going right. separate ways. I just made up. this is a terrible mistake on my part. Whatever you do here at Davos this year, look at John Carney in the Wall Street Journal's wonderful article on hand movements at Davos. I'm very paranoid now about my hand movements, Ian. Because he just did a wonderful spoof. You go like this, you go like this. So I'm, I'm, I'm worried about my hand. You, well, you, you have larger hand movements than most people. Yeah, do. that's true. <laughs> well, I got to be careful about hand movements. Arif, you are optimistic within uh, some of the gloom that's here when you look at Ian Bremmer's hollow alliance. Do, do emerging markets, and for that matter, the Middle East, but let's take it broader. Do they need to go it alone finally and begin to ignore economically and politically? The Look, developed we're, world? We're, I, the first thing I think we should do is take a deep breath and not panic and not get concerned. And yes, there is a negative mood in Davos, but I think it is more a question of people coming into this, forced by geopolitics to think negatively and try and see if this becomes a self-fulfilling prof prophecy. Let's step back from that for a second. And let's just look at what you mean when you talk about emerging markets. And there is a reason I call them global growth markets. And that is not just my optimism. It is the sheer dynamism and the sheer force of numbers. Okay, So Tom, if you look at the long-term trend lines that these markets represent, Two-thirds of global GDP growth till 2030 is going to come from these markets. Two-thirds of consumption growth till 2030 is going to come from these markets. Not from the US, not from Europe, not from anywhere else, from these markets. They already make up more than half of global GDP on a PPP basis, and they're going to go to two-thirds. 90% of the world's urban population growth is happening here, and 90% of the world's population under 30 live here. So let's stop for a second and think, how is Coca-Cola, Nike, Nestle, Kimberly Clark, and the list will keep going on. How do you think they're going to make their money, Tom? They're going to be selling there. Mm -hmm. More importantly, they're going to be investing their capex there. So when you look at my optimism framed in that light, right. 
And no, no, hang on. And, and, and sorry. And, and because there's no point completing half a sentence. And when you look at the fact that these uh, opportunities that we see in these markets translate themselves into a higher consumption capacity by the people in these markets, you'll see why optimism is present. Within that, Mike, I go back to your wonderful book on global growth of a few years ago on convergence. It's a spectacular, thoughtful book that's not dated at all. Part of this optimism is a new transnational company that's going to invest for growth within emerging markets. You're in China a lot. Do you see a new corporate action that, that leads to a better growth pattern and a better optimism, as Arif talks about? Well, I do. I mean, I think that, you know, on, on a medium to long term basis, all of that is exactly true, unless there's a cataclysmic destruction of the convergence process. These, all these economies have higher potential growth and so on. In the short run, Tom, uh, <clears throat> there are questions of volatility. There's a slowdown in these markets because the other half of the global economy isn't growing very much, and those are big markets, yes. Europe. I did a calculation. The advanced countries, the so-called developed countries, since the start of 2008 have grown a total of 6% cumulatively. In that, in that period, China grew 60 or 70%. Now, I don't know how they did that exactly, but it produced some imbalances on the way through. But, but I think the opportunity is enormous. And then if you're talking specifically about China, the, only, the remaining questions is, the Chinese government's management of the economy with respect to access to foreign uh, competitors. And I, I, I have to say that's an open question. And don't you think that the, the fact that the commodity super cycle is now over, that's a recognized fact. And it, we can put that behind us. But despite that, these emerging markets, as we refer to them, are going to be delivering us 4 to 4.5% four growth right. this year. And then, the, the, the thing that you speak of, which moves away from the commodity super cycle, right. is the commodity super cycle of, just to begin with, health. Yeah. We were talking before this panel, oh, I'm thinking of things I learned in grade school or college or whatever on microbiology and virology. Forget about that. The health opportunity within emerging markets can participate with growth. Discuss that, please. Huge health opportunity because, basically, as the economy grows, you, you know, in, the, in various populations, you eat better, you start sending your children to better schools, you need better health. And if you go to a place like China, there is very little access. So there is a huge amounts of investments going in China, but also in Africa, in uh, Latin America. While other sectors are getting hit, a lot of money is going into health and private education, the reason being people need it. And, um, and if you look, um, we all looked at the numbers for uh, MSCI and how much the market has got beaten up 14% last year, uh, a lot the previous year, all, already more than 10% this year. If you look actually at the health uh, side, much less. And if you invest well in these countries, and we invest across all of them, uh, there is huge opportunities. The insurance sector is growing in these countries, providing insurance for health as well as health delivery, as well as hospital systems, as well as uh, generate drugs. And you have unfortunately, sadly, got the big problem of diabetes. For example, we're talking in India. Um, you know, normally you would think when I was working at the World Bank, there were all kinds of other diseases we were working on, right. and they still are there in many of these countries. But some of our diseases in the developed world have now transferred in a huge way to the developing country, creating uh, one potentially future fiscal drain, but the other side of it, the flip side in the market, is opportunities for investments. Ian, comment on what's in our textbooks that we all learned about the emerging world. I mean, you can take it by, I mean, we're honored that Professor Spencer, with us studying with John Hicks at Oxford a few years ago, moved from Michael Spencer's undergraduate era, in, in graduate era, forward to the youngest person in the room, the emerging market textbook, totally different. And you've captured this in your G0 outlook. Are the institutions there to help with the optimism we hear at the end of the row here? Well, clearly the institutions are weaker. Um, it's a reason why we should be ultimately more optimistic about a country like Brazil. 
Uh, I mean, does anyone looking at Mexico really think there's less corruption in Mexico than there's in Brazil? Or we just haven't looked into it closely, right? Uh, I don't think you should necessarily be penalized long term when we're thinking about where the trajectories are going when the fact that you actually have a judicial process. I mean, of the BRICS, right? I mean, in Russia and China, there'd be show trials. And in India, it would take 10 to 15 years to actually get to a court that could actually see it, right? Mm -hmm. Brazil is in the middle, but ultimately, I think they work through it. Look, one thing that I think is very interesting about emerging markets, if we want to talk about this really big theme of the fourth industrial revolution, right? When it hits, if it hits, it's hitting here. And it's hitting here in two very different ways. The first way it's hitting is to the extent that you're gonna be unemploying lots of people, you're talking about the global middle class. That's not the United States and Europe, we're all rich people. That's what happens when China no longer has the ability to have relevant manufacturing and service labor. And they don't have the institutions to handle that and their politics are gonna react very badly. So that's an enormous risk. And that's gonna be true across the EM space. The other side of this, and you, you, know, you mentioned, you, you kind of got me thinking about it when you talked about healthcare, is that the fourth industrial revolution means that sectors are becoming, every sector is becoming kind of strategic from an IT perspective, right? Like healthcare is not just about providing health, it's a lot of really powerful data. Well, do we think as that hits that a state like China or Russia is not w going to want to play a much more interventionist role in terms of understanding that data, controlling that data, manipulating that data, profiting from that data. I mean, I, I think there's a lot to play for here. ExxonMobil has known that their, that their sector has been strategic for decades. I, I don't think that the healthcare providers necessarily think that way, especially when they go into China. If the fourth industrial revolution hits the way people have been talking about, like before, just before the robot takeover, I, I think that you know, this is gonna be a core question um, it, for, for these markets. Michael Spence, to take it back to Adam Smith, is there a constructive invisible hand in emerging markets that's different than in the developed world, which again leads to an optimism about future growth. Yeah, it's, it's the dynamics, it's the trend. You know, so if you took an early stage develop, developing economy without the institutional infrastructure and all the other things, you'd say, gee, this isn't gonna work. But that's not how the process works. They build the economy, they build the resources to invest, they build the capabilities. Look, look, at the, look at macroeconomic management of World Banks 25 years ago in emerging economies and now. They're superbly talented and competent. In, and that's just one example, Tom. So I think these barriers and challenges are real, yeah. some internal, some external, but there's a fairly long <coughs> and improving track record of, ma of managing through them quite well. Uh, Ricardo, I'll come to you in a moment. Ricardo, how does Brazil find stability besides holding an Olympics? I mean, uh, without, I don't need you to comment on the immense political challenges uh, within Brazil right now, but is Brazil, is, Maybe it is an emerging market, but boy, is it its own political economic experiment. What is your optimism that they will get back on a growth trajectory? Well, I'm always an optimist by nature. I'm even more cautious optimistic in this case. And uh, I agree with Ian, uh, what he said, uh, that although we're going to this storm oil, very challenging crisis uh, on the economic side, on the fiscal side, more than we've been seeing the last 70 years. I'm a cautious optimist on Brazil. It's still the seventh biggest economy uh, in the world. We have some difficulty in managing the, the state, but we're still a great nation full of entrepreneurs, full of uh, people with good values, uh, people who believe and build in the country, they keep the money into the country. We have good institutions that are being tested in this stress test that we are suffering. The three powers are quite uh, working well and independent. The judiciary is doing a great work in cleaning up uh, the political sphere and the, the, the business level mm -hmm. in order to prepare Brazil for this uh, new cycle. We have a very democratic country. It's a mature democracy. People are on the streets protesting, reivindicating, empower citizens so they can demand their rights and the quality of the public service they, they deserve. But if you look at Brazil, for sure we're going to have a low growth environment uh, going forward the next few years, and also uh, a current account adjustment going forward, and that depreciation of the currency will help uh, in that way. Our John Micklethwaite spoke with the newly minted uh, leader of Argentina today. What did you learn from the Argentinian election for all of Latin America? 
Well, it's a funny story. I was here with Mark in a panel like this two years ago, and he presented to the public that uh, he will be a candidate for the president, uh, presidency of the uh, Argentinian government. Mm -hmm. They had a, tr a strategy to do so, and he'll win. I saw the faces of the people, a lot of doubt. But he said, if I go to the second round, things can change, politics not uh, linear. And I really believe in him, because uh, knowing him from the, from the past and all his career, is very business-friendly um, politician, a leader. He's doing a great job in taking the reforms and opening up the country to the, the real world, debt capital markets, uh, finishing the CEPO Cambiario, the, the, the controls, the import and export barriers that Argentina had, and having an inflation targeting regime to fight the high inflation levels mm -hmm. that Argentina has. So if you talk to Argentinians, they have confidence now. Although the economy is still in recession, they have confidence that the country will get better, they will invest, they start bringing even the money back to the country. So uh, I'm an um, optimist of Argentina and the relationship that right. Argentina has with Brazil on trade. Arif, Arif, within the business dealings you have, and particularly within private transactions, fold in the government changes within the Middle East. If, if we look at the immense challenges that Saudi Arabia has right now and have been witnessed even in the last few weeks, how do you perceive governments to support a rebound in economic growth within the Middle East? I think... Look, the Middle East is a complex, both geopolitical uh, exercise to try and unravel, especially in the context of the outcome of the Arab Spring and the more recent developments in Syria, et cetera. You can't disaggregate them, but you can, it's equally not right, in my opinion, to sort of put everything into one bundle. Saudi Arabia, at the end of the day, yes, is going through uh, a structural reform issue simply caused by the fact that the oil price is low, but Saudi Arabia also made a very strong policy statement a couple of years ago or 18 months ago where it stated very clearly that it was going to maintain market share. So it knows what it's doing and it knows how to go about doing it as well. At the same time, countries like the UAE and Qatar have been preparing for a reduction in the price for a long time, so they're not that affected either. Now, this is not just my natural optimism talking. This is just facts on the ground. This is how businesses are growing. We're making investment decisions all the time. But if I can use that example and just say that for a second, let's take a step back in this discussion across markets and say we need to stop thinking of investing in this part of the world in this acronym-based approach. So we had BRICS, and then we had emerging markets, and we have all of these mm. things. Let's disaggregate it for a second, Tom, and say there are actually three buckets. Okay, One is China, very clearly. The second is the commodity-driven countries, if I can be simplistic. And the third is private consumption-driven economies. Okay, Now, China is a facet all by itself. A slow China at 4.5% is still double a fast West. Okay, And we shouldn't really be too surprised about what China is doing because analysts for a long time have been arguing that these rates have to come down for long-term stability. And then you have the commodity-driven countries. Of course, they're going to get affected. And then you have countries that are exporting to China that are going to get affected, like Angola and Zimbabwe. And then you have these private consumption-driven economies that are actually booming. Give us some names there. So, for example, from an e that, that's where I invest in. That's what I call global growth markets. So I will talk to you about countries such as Mexico, Colombia, Peru, and Chile in South America. I will talk to you about countries in North Africa and uh, Ghana and Nigeria. Kenya doing quite well. In, the, in, in Asia, we're talking about Vietnam and Indonesia that are doing extremely well from a growth perspective. And where our, we put our money is in private companies. Why? Because they're more reflective of the economy and they're much more dry. They are the causes of driving the employment cycle in those economies. Mm -hmm. They're the causes of driving value creation in those economies. We're too often driven by this public market hysteria, right? Public markets, Did you unfortunately- you shot at Bloomberg? No, of course not. <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> Good thing it's no, not a sponsored panel. No, but these important observations. Ian, you wanted to jump in here with an observation on, on uh, uh, the, 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 the groupings that we have. Well, no, the story, we groupings are great, first of all. I mean, I, I think everyone here can agree. I mean, Goldman Sachs got rid of the BRICS, uh, you know, sort of fund only 88% from the top. 
Um, and uh, I don't think anyone could put Russia in the same category as Brazil. I mean, you know, the markets have literally, you know, nothing in common mm. in the way that they're proceeding. Um, but I do think the geopolitics of this are becoming an interesting overlay, right? Mm. Because this year, we're trying to figure out, we understand Europe has macro implications. We understand China has macro implications. We're trying to figure out if the Middle East has macro implications. And we don't really know yet, right? Because right now, the United States is acting like it's Rwanda. We're spending a lot of money trying to fix it, right? A lot of humanitarian aid. But aside from that, there's really not a lot of interest in intervention. I've had at least 10 people ask me, how are we going to fix refugees? We don't have any, any solution. And I'm like, yeah, of course we have a solution. Not our problem. But the country... That's our, that's our solution. The country through which those refugees are flowing, which is Turkey, yes. happens to be going through a much smaller deficit than it's ever had, thanks to the, thanks to the fact that the oil prices are low. And its economy is growing at you know a fairly decent whack as well. Absolutely true. So. Um, and, and, but my, my point, but all, and Turkey's also got governance issues, and yes. they've got you know security issues and all the rest. But I think about the Middle East itself. To what extent over the next three five years, as this persists, because anyone that looks at oil. Iran versus Saudi Arabia, US, Europe, basic geopolitics understands that the Middle East crises are going to get worse. Whether it's Yemen or Syria or Iraq, we know this. But the question is, is that going to actually cause suddenly geopolitics to make oil prices whiplash when Saudi Arabia becomes unstable? Or does it become another Islamic state in a part of the territory that nobody else wants and has no cash that basically gets contained? And you have a whole bunch of these, lots of little failed states. The one other thing that I think we need to pay attention to is why is it that these incredibly capable in terms of recruiting and social media, uh, in terms of uh, creating explosive devices, no cyber, right? I mean, the North Koreans could take down Sony pictures and make everyone aware of it, but so far, Boko Haram, ISIS, not at all. We need to figure that out because that's going to give you a, a, another good answer to what extent this is ultimately Rwanda or it's going to become much Very more Very quickly, you're off topic, Ian. Did you yeah. see uh, a, a change or a tone or a difference from Secretary Kerry today in his comments here? Tone? Not real. I mean, he's, he's become more somber, I think. I mean, no, clearly, despite, the, I mean, you know, Iran was triumphalist. He worked on yeah. it, you know, solidly for two years. And I think now he's back in the, oh, my God, look at all these other things now that I'm not doing Iran anymore, and realizing that it's, it's problematic. Right. Right? Dr. Beschloss, he was more somber because of Redskins football. All right. Uh, <laughs> help me here, Dr. Beschloss, in tying so much of this together is, and what I love about your idea is it's away from what the media covers, which is the grind, yes. as Michael has written about, right. of a modern economy. Right. You have, an, uh, along with the reef, an immense optimism away from the headlines, right. away from the gloom. I think what we're not discussing is that in emerging markets, you have to look over long periods of time. The volatility, of vol the volatility in emerging markets is higher, as Michael said. The volatility of vol volatility in August, last August, was higher than in 2008, not just in emerging markets, but in global markets, which people have not really particularly looked at. So in a world that is more volatile, within that, an emerging world which is even more volatile, you don't want to invest in short term in emerging markets. You have to have a view, whether you invest in liquid markets, um, you know, I think you can invest in liquid markets, you can invest in equity markets, bond markets, uh, private markets, real estate markets across credit markets in these countries, and there are lots of opportunities. But if you don't have a 10-year perspective, you should not be going into these countries. And the interesting thing is, these markets are so volatile that if we look in three months, potentially, the numbers could be terrible or wonderful. Mm. It's that volatile, depending on your start and ending date. So, so I think the thing that I would remind us to right. think about is think long term. Remember, volatility is your friend in emerging markets if you use it right. Geopolitics has always been there. Macro has always been there. And in order to make money or lose money in emerging markets, you have to be aware of what's going on with the politics of where Actually, you're investing. What, what you're saying is the real opportunity, 100%, right? The real opportunity is investing in the micro, yes. investing in the specific right. companies Absolutely. in the specific sectors Absolutely. that give rise to enormous value creation over that period. And yeah. I would add one more thing. Please. Find the best local teams. Yes. Because the best people to invest are the right. local teams in these countries. You because live that, you like that, Ricardo, every day. Yep. Yes, indeed. And I, I totally agree with my colleague's uh, comments. Uh, although we have this scenario when growth deceleration is the new normal, 
fundamentals still matter. And if we look at well, how we invest in their blocks of countries, there is no homogeneous emerging yes. markets. As well, there are no homogeneous Latin America. Mm -hmm. So if you look one block, countries are doing well. They were mentioned Chile, Colombia, and Peru. They're growing uh, more than the, the average of the other countries. And the other side have Brazil, Argentina, in harsh recessions, although you have uh, Argentina a brighter future with a more mm -hmm market-friendly government. You have Venezuela on the other side on the verge of collapse with hyperinflation and desperate need for uh, humanitarian aid. And Mexico was just listening to the president in the mm -hmm. other room. is a different case because Mexico is, a, is not exporter of commodities, exporter of manufactured goods, totally correlated, uh, very correlated with the, with the US. So uh, we are in the business here as a bank of managing risk, managing volatility, not the, ma the managing or the business of avoiding risk. So we know that because we have survived through many different economic credit right. cycle and volatile turbulent periods, and we've been stronger and more resilient in each one of those occasions. One of the observations I've seen recently, I think of Robert Sinch at Amherst Pierpont for years at Bank of America and before that Bear Stearns, is the advantage Mexico has from the new labor arbitrage, currency depreciation through 18 on peso, and all of a sudden, some of these emerging markets with the adjacency to the United States, some of these emerging markets become extremely competitive with China. Steve Roach's labor arbitrage moves back across the Pacific. Yep. Would you, right. Did you see that? Do you observe that uh, with your bank in Mexico and within Latin America? And in Mexico, as a particular condition, at some point, the unit labor cost in Mexico was more competitive than in China. So with the maquilladora, they could you know, leverage a lot of exports, a car and other aggregate, with value aggregation to, to the world. And the reforms that uh, the president and the minister Videgaray did also helped a boost to differentiate the economic uh, of Mexico, although growth has not been materialized in, in, in that economy. So what we see in Mexico is different with, with Latin America, but has a NAFTA a trade agreement with North America, which also benefit Mexico. And curious enough, when you think about oil prices, I think, oh, okay, on the other hand, Mexico has been affected given the dependency on the oil uh, prices. Interestingly enough, uh, in the past, 80% of exports of Mexico was oil dependent, not mm -hmm. only 6%. So they diversified the economy in such a way that uh, they're more you know, able to go through those turbulent times. Michael Spence, you spent an inordinate amount of time recently thinking about China. How will they respond to these different actions by uh, Arif's three emerging markets? They've got the labor the currency adjustment and maybe a labor arbitrage with Mexico, et cetera. They've got capital flows and resources they can acquire everywhere. What do you presume China will do with unchallenged economic growth over the next five years? Well, I think they're going to do several things. First of all, they anticipated this. They knew, as their predecessors who went through the middle income transition knew, that they could not stay in the labor-intensive process-oriented manufacturing sectors. And they've, they've, they decided that long ago, and they're busy trying to <clears throat> produce the structural transformation that drives the economy in a different way. With innovation, higher value added on the tradable side, more services, more reliance on the demand side, on domestic consumption. Um, in my view, as a personal view, uh, the fact that the president of China has an external agenda that includes a currency that's internationalizing and, a, you know, an AIIB and a bunch of other things has caused them to open the capital account prematurely relative to the maturity of the markets. And, and I, having watched for a long time, I, I have to say, in a, in a highly competent, Organ set of organizations and people with respect to economic management, the financial market management recently has been unaccustomedly cl clumsy, to put it mildly. Um, I don't expect this to persist, but, uh, but uh, the last thing I'd say, Thomas, China is now, there are tensions in this system because they're caught between several things. So they want a dynamic, innovative economy, mm -hmm. but they haven't completely given up the idea of control. They want market-driven outcomes, but they haven't really settled the issue of SOEs, and that affects foreign direct investors. You know, they want, uh, they want to control the internet. They, you know, they want to make sure the academics don't say too many subversive things. That's a good idea. You know, and, 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 and similar things on the financial side. So I, I think mm -hmm. the remaining uncertainty about China's success in completing this journey has to do with resolving those tensions the right way. Arif, can you invest in China? 
Uh, no, we don't. But that's not to say that we won't. And there are reasons why we don't. There's a reason why I, earlier on I was telling you about the economies that we do invest in, because they're the ones that exhibit the greatest level of growth. And that is why we stick to them. And the one thing we've always run away from is this acronym-based investing approach. So we will invest into the countries that fulfill the criteria that we think is driving growth in these emerging markets, which are urbanization, a young population, which is increasingly middle class and consumption based. So while everybody was jumping up and down about sub-Saharan Africa being a commodity right. story, the reality is there's 300 million Africans in sub-Saharan Africa that are in the middle classes and coming into them. And even within that, if you are smart and you differentiate between lower middle class and upper middle class, you have the opportunity to invest into businesses that cater to the local requirements. So I think at the end of the day, it is not about one big landscape that we're painting. It is about extremely smart, focused investing. And I loved your point earlier about local teams because those of us that have put local teams down are seeing the benefits right. of it. Okay. What's the worst practice, Arif, of multinationals and trinationals? They've learned through mistakes over the years. What's the worst practice right now? Why is it world? that you're consistently asking me the questions that get me in trouble with my friends? That's why I'm doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Ian, Ian, why there we have, so I'm gonna, where, where are we on time? I'm going seven more minutes, and I, I must admit, I have to give the first question to Professor Tyson of Berkeley, who's sitting over here quietly. I'll go to you here, here in a moment, just to prepare, to warn you. Seven minute warning, Laura. Um, uh, I, I, I look, Ian, at, at the emotion, and you are acclaimed for your books on the J curve and the G zero nation. Fold this optimism on emerging markets in the micro level analysis back to the collapse of G20, G8 to G7, to your acclaimed book, G0. Where do we go from, is, can we go G negative? Well, go, uh, the, uh, two, two quick points. One is to understand where we're going, we need to understand to what extent the Westphalian system holds. Are states going to be as strong actors in determining governance and power in the next five and 10 years as they are now? Right, and you know that you see erosions, right? And some of it's good erosion, like Paris, and you know you, you get more of an agreement because mayors are more involved, and you know CEOs yep. are more involved, industrialists are more involved. It's great. On the other hand, you know you see bad because no one's fighting ISIS effectively, and so anonymous says we're Batman, and right that you don't want that, right? So it depends on which direction that goes. But the other big question, of course, is this one country that's its own category, which is China, and China wants it. Professor Spence said it; he, they want it both ways. But there's a reason they want it both ways. It's because their population actually reflects both countries, right? You can't, China's, in a sense, China's in two baskets. When I think about what Gorbachev tried to do with the Soviet Union, everyone, everyone looks at the two things, the political openness, glasnost, what the Chinese don't want, and then they look at the economic transformation, perestroika, which the Chinese do want. Can they do it? There was a third thing. The third thing was decentralization, a recognition that not everything could be decided in Moscow, which in the Soviet Union was a disaster because you know, when you decentralize, you got 15 new countries. But in China, when you look at the demands, the composition of the population in Shanghai or in Beijing and what they want from the government, the kind of openness, increasingly rule of law, the ability to protect themselves versus local competition, better standards, sending their kids to American institutions, you know, that kind of thing, getting their money out if they need to. Compare that to what you want in the interior of the country when you just want another 10% growth, you don't care if it's coal heavy, you just want it, you're not worried as much about product safety, but you want your kids to have a better lifestyle than you do. And if the Chinese government doesn't understand that they need to be able to decentralize and govern these two different parts of the country effectively, they're gonna be in a train wreck. And the thing that I worry about most is that the country that is set to become the largest economy in the world relatively soon fundamentally will not take what they perceive to be an unacceptable okay. risk. Well, that worries me. Uh, basically, I think what nobody is talking about is why was China's growth as high as it was? Why was it? I think the reason it, it, it came on to, if we look at sort of growth rates in China, and Professor Spence will talk much better than myself, but basically you went through a period where they entered the world economy. Mm. I remember the first missions I had from the World Bank going into China, and there were no cars. You remember all those days? There was really no stores, no cars, no, cl no real differentiation in clothing. And basically, as money came in, they were like sponge. So they learned 
te on the technical side. They brought in the best technical experts to learn from. Then moving forward, as, as uh, post-2008, as money was flowing in, they did the opposite to what everybody else did. They really built up their infrastructure. They built up their liquidity. They built up the big reserves in currency, and so on and so forth. And what you got is this period of unprecedented growth. No country has had that kind of growth. When was so it I think that, that they didn't is, have cars? When was it they didn't? It was like the first time I went. With the, like you would see one car on the road every 15, 20 yeah, minutes. And that was probably 25 years ago. So imagine in 25 right. years, they've had to do exactly. what it took America 100 yeah. years to do. Right? So, so they've so done the everything is, exactly on yeah. such fast speed. Right. So the question in China, I think, is very much what you said. But as Professor Spence said, the very important thing is they have joined the SDR. They don't really like to be called an emerging market anymore. They are in a different category, as we said. It's not a BRIC, yeah. it's not an EM. And I think that's kind of really important. They are now uh, leading the G20 this year. They will make every effort to not have currency collapse, um, kind of anything unruly, if they can control it. They may sure not be able to communicate not, it. Well, can, can I just make one very small please, point? Please. China actually has some very, very smart economists as well. Absolutely. Just wanted to put that on the table. Michael Spence, <laughs> comment on that, and I'd like you to write the next chapter of Jonathan Spence's classic book, The Making of Modern China. Where is that next chapter? What is it? Well, I think that's what we've been talking about. So there's an awful lot. I mean, in, in all of these countries, there's tremendously smart people. There's great entrepreneurs. I mean, that really is the, the core source of the optimism. And then when you get a little worried, it's because of the governance problems that we're now talking about. They really, you know, you, you may be able to go another 10 years with a, a kind of single party system, but it sure has to change its attitudes toward you know, management. I think Ian was right also in saying this something this complicated has to be decentralized. Mm -hmm. uh, and right now, the power appears to have gravitated very, very concentratedly into the president's office. So I, I could go on for hours, but because of time, with 14 minutes left, Professor Tyson, Laura Tyson of the Haas School of Berkeley, please an observate, no? Terrific panel, I think, uh, terrific panel, and I would say the themes of uh, micro and uh, f focus on place and focus on investors and focus on sectors and focus on consumers and focus on the long term, that's really the issue. I will say I take a little exception with uh, the notion of the two Chinas, Ian. I, I think we, we need to keep in mind that right now, from the point of view of the Chinese population. This is actually one of the most trusted governments that delivered from the majority of its population in the world. Mm -hmm. They are in a very difficult transition period. That's absolutely true. There's been a fair amount of decentralization. Actually, one, it, certainly in terms of, say, local governance, complaints against, is the society working for you, are registered a lot at the local level. It's true that the central government has been bringing some power back, but that's partly because there was a lot of this uh, sort of credit and debt boom was really out of control sort of use of leverage by local governments. So I actually think that what I would say is China's involved in a very, very difficult transition that we've heard, but I'm a little more optimistic that it's not something that has to do right now with the legitimacy of the Chinese government in the eyes of the Chinese population. Look, I agree completely that the Chinese government is legitimate in the eyes of the Chinese population. In fact, I would argue that most Chinese view their government today as more legitimate than most Americans view their government, without any question. But that doesn't mean that they view them as legitimate for the same reasons. Um, and I think that if you're poorer, you view the government as legitimate because they provided growth. And if you're wealthier, you have a lot of patriotism about what they've done, but you now have very different demands. It's product safety. Um, and it's accountability and responsibility of local officials. It's very different. And I, I do think that um, this, this centralization trend brings up one other thing that we need to pay a lot of attention to, that even in places where you have really strong, really impressive leaders, Xi Jinping's an incredibly impressive guy, he's attracted enormously meritocratic talent around him. So has Modi. But in an emerging market, what do you do when that leader has kind of gutted a lot of the institutional mechanisms because so much is around them. We're not even talking about Putin here. We're talking about like good leaders. And yet, 
How do you how do you make that transition? I think there's a re long term. You're creating some really big risk and uncertainty in precisely those sorts of situations. Never mind what you see in Saudi Arabia, Russia. I think you're taking a photograph where you should be looking at a video. And what I mean by that <laughs> is that yes, today you may have certain issues in relation to China per se today, but we have to also remember that all of this in the backdrop of history, what they have done in 25 years is unprecedented in the history of humanity. Equally, where they're going in terms of the structural adjustment to the economy, moving to a consumption-led growth pattern, et cetera, these are all issues that most people have not dealt with before. Let's not forget how many people China has taken out of the mm -hmm. poverty trap, okay? And then when we talk about China, we've spent the whole hour and we haven't touched upon what is arguably probably the best uh, investment opportunity in the world in the coming decade, which is India, okay? India is a fantastic opportunity, but guess what? It has serious issues too. Oil is down, yes, and everybody is immediately jumping onto the bandwagon that says Saudi Arabia is about to get gutted and destroyed. Guys, it's not about to do any of those because when that price is down, it has the opportunity right. to do structural reform. Tangential here, what's your business experience in India, Arif? Uh, strong, very good, and to me- What's the stereotype we most get wrong in that emerging market? So the bureaucracy is a force to be dealt with, <laughs> and it is a force that India has to deal with. <clears throat> The second element, of course, is that um, it is difficult for foreign investment to get control of businesses and make changes the way that it intends to. And I think India itself is beginning to realize that. Entrepreneurs are beginning to realize that. And I think to attract more foreign capital, more and more businesses are realizing that the need for tomorrow is to actually work in partnership. Actually, in India, you can't, if you wanted to buy Indian stocks, it's very hard. You can buy Chinese stocks, you can buy Brazilian stocks, but to buy Chinese stocks, they, they haven't even cracked yeah. that much. So. Another question over here, sir. Thank you. Eugenio Madero from Mexico. Congratulations, great panel to all of you. There's a question to Ian. I think uh, the US consumer has the most disposable income over the past five years, so the oil tax cut. And on the other hand, America produces now 10 million barrels of oil. He's in oil independent, if you will, no? You can discuss that with fracking and price of oil. How do you, strong do you see the United States the next three to four years vis-a-vis -vis, uh, emerging markets? Look, from my perspective, this is a question I think for the whole panel, not just for me. Um, the United States benefits immensely from having this geopolitical buffer. Great neighbors of Mexico, Canada, and two oceans. The Europeans don't have that. Um, the Asians have some of it now, but it's going to get more problematic over time. So that's, that's one point. Um, but I don't think you can look at the United States and pretend everything is rosy given the election situation you have right now. I, I don't believe that, that Trump can win, and, I don't, uh, and even if he does, I don't think the impact on the markets are immense. But I do think that there is a serious issue that's partially economic, flat wages for decades, and partially about an America that is changing radically. We're talking about emerging markets changing radically. The United States, if you think about how women's role in society has changed, how much less religious it's becoming, how much more multicultural it's becoming, drug legalization, um, I mean, all of these issues that make a lot of people in the middle class, a lot of white people in the middle class, feel kind of really unnerved that the country's moving away from them, even if they're doing economically okay. Um, and I think that that's behind this. And it, I expect, there's nothing that makes me believe that's going to get addressed by the next president of the United States or by the next Congress. If that persists for another eight years, uh, mm. I think my answer to your question is gonna be different. It's gonna be less confident than it is today. My observation is we mentioned Mr. Trump at 51 minutes, 12 seconds, which is pretty, pretty good. Good job. I would like to talk to you about the adjacency to the United States. If we look at Latin America, if we look at all the horrific stereotypes of my study through the years of the United States, as we look south, give me the, the, the pushback from the Latin America of how so much of Latin America will go alone and doesn't need the United States. Actually, we need the United States. It's welcome to have a, you know, the help of the United States as a, a big market. We have to, to learn a, a successful capitalist uh, society. 
and uh, in terms of policy, because in my humble view, the real true emerging market was the United States. After the crisis, yes. it rebounded really, really strong with resilience, with entrepreneurship, innovation, this uh, industrial force, industrial revolution, and it's growing and creating and creating jobs. And uh, we see this tougher economic uh, situation that was mentioned here with the case of China, lower growth of China, and also the worsening trade terms of trade, mm -hmm. looking at the headwinds for our region of the world and slowing growth. And when we look to our region of the world, if, if you don't have big markets to export, my view is that we are just seeing the beginning of a era of austerity and the end of the decade of prosperity that we had uh, in our right. part of the world. Is Cuba in your Latin America? Where will no, they be not. in five years? It's, I mean, I, it's an, I don't want to get you in trouble. Well, never here, say never. Now that uh, yeah. never say never, it, it's it's a small market anyway. The U.S. now okay. have some uh, agreements, but we have other priorities uh, in the region uh, rather than consider Cuba. I see some uh, prospects, but in Central America, rather focus in Panama, for example. Yeah, Ian, a quick update on Cuba that you've written for Eurasia Group. Uh, what, I mean, what do you see there in the next Everybody wants years? to go, right? I mean, the Cuban Americans all have a plan for something they want to do when they're over there. The politics have really shifted. I mean, Marco Rubio, sure, is opposed because it's kind of cheap vote yeah. and he has to be. But ultimately, there's really not much opposition to opening up Cuba. The question will be how vulnerable, how insecure the Cuban government feels, kind of like the supreme leader in Iran. Go back to right at the beginning. We said, is Iran going to be an attractive market? Well, if the Supreme Leader thinks that by making an attractive market that they've written the end of the theocracy in Iran, it's going to be a much less attractive market. That's a kind of core question for Cuba. Uh, uh, well, some final thoughts here, but Professor Spence, I want to start with you in that part of our seminar, and they asked me, Mara Joe asked me to really stay on. The script here is rising U.S. interest rates, which tells me Janet Yellen is the central banker to emerging markets. Is that a correct statement? Is Chair Yellen the central banker to emerging markets? No, it's not really correct. I mean, the, the, look at, I mean, you, you know, the old theory was that if your exchange rate fluctuated and you were autonomous with respect to monetary policy, I don't think anybody believes that in its pure form anymore. So all of these countries have had to do the best they can defending themselves from what you might call post-crisis recovery distortions in the international monetary system. And, you know, that's a hard thing to do. You can accumulate reserves, create buffers, you can put up capital controls or frictions, a lot of things. But, you know, it's not an easy exercise, and frankly, there's no textbook for it. So, yes, to some extent, she is the central banker to a very large part of the world. Dr. Beschloss, we look at uh, the impossible trinity, which is the macroeconomics of inter international economics. What is your impossible trinity <coughs> for the growth and the building of these economies. One's got to be a good political foundation, good rule of law. Tell me some other ideas that are going to be the underpinning to, to growth. Um, I should first say that the sad thing post-2008, as liquidity came into emerging markets, mm -hmm. is that we did waste an opportunity to build the rule of law, build the institutions you need. You need a financial sector that is solid and that operates, that is transparent. For example, in Brazil, tra relatively transparent, but the cost of transactions are very high. So you need a financial um, system that is transparent, but also um, the costs are reasonable. A lot of costs uh, within the financial sector of transactions are still non-transparent non, uh, and, and pretty high. Um, in terms of sort of the rule of law, as you said, I think it's a bigger thing. Uh, it's, the go it's not just the rule of law in terms of governments and rule of law to make sure that you know, Putin doesn't keep all your money in there, uh, but it's also governance of the companies at the company level. Again, going back to the theme of micro, that is a huge thing still within this, com this country, especially as there are lots and lots of family-owned businesses that come into the, into the right. economy and still run not quite well. So those, I would say, are really quite large. And then, of course, the structure of the economy and creating power shortages are the biggest problems in, across every single emerging market and dealing with that. Place. So the mantra when you, your people were building your great country was go west, young man. I think almost inexorably the mantra today is go east, young man. I think the reality of these markets transcends any short-term thinking around where instability happens. I am not advocating to anyone in this room, everybody's a smart investor, don't rush to put your money in today. Things are a bit unclear. 
and the market sentiment is a little bit dicey. But that means in the private space, in the course of the coming 12 months, there will be some fantastic buying opportunities. And as you rightly pointed out, if you've got the stomach to hold it out for 10 years, eight years, five years, you will make a lot of capital returns. When you put that against a backdrop of governance reform that is needed, and the fact that currencies and the lower oil price is going to, by definition, lead to structural reform in economies that are dependent on oil. So why would you continue to subsidize uh, you know, basic commodities? Of course, you're going to do away with them. Of course, you'll impose VAT. Those are normal, sensible things. And those, in turn, will help provide stimulus to the economies. So in overall terms, I feel very strongly that there has not been a better time to look at putting capital to work over a 10-year cycle than today. This has been absolutely wonderful. I come away with the two major takeaways, and, and I, I love so much what I heard about thinking micro, much like we heard in Paris at the, at the climate talks. And the other thing is don't listen to the media. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.